So what I'm going to talk about is um, a little bit broadly about what we've done in Aero Astro in terms of active learning and then um, something that I've developed in terms of recitations um, that I haven't had a chance to share before. So this is a good way to, uh, to do that. Um, well. so, um, so what is active learning? So it's, it's basically any technique that um, stresses the student's active involvement in their own learning. And there's a definition here by Hake. It's the interactive engagement of students in heads-on and hands-on activities which yield immediate feedback through discussions with peers and or instructors. And that immediate feedback is really useful uh, because it tells students where they understand and where they don't understand what's going on. And it tells the instructors too. So the conventional way to figure out whether a class knows what's going on is to give them an examination, at which point it's too late to change the outcome, right? So as a control engineer, I know that frequent high bandwidth uh, feedback is useful in controlling a system, in, in this case, an educational system. So um, lots of reasons for using active learning. We've heard some increased gains in understanding this feedback to instructors, which I find particularly helpful. Um, it can be more motivating to students, and so that if they're interested and awake, they're going to learn more, obviously. Um, and it can accommodate different um, learning styles. So I'm going to go really quickly through a couple slides. Uh, when I taught in Unified, and when I, in any class I use active learning, uh, I learned from Lori that I should explain to students what we're doing. And actually, the slides that you're seeing are slides that we give in Unified. Um, so there's a whole host of active learning methods, and I won't go through these, but we've actually used all of these uh, in Aero Astro and others. Um, and you know, broadly, it's cooperative activities um, like turn to your partner discussions or concept tests, and then individual activities where the student's responsible, such as cold calling. I might call on a student. Knowing my, I might call on them makes them responsible for the material, or they might have a reading quiz to make sure they've done the reading and so on. Um, I'm, I, I'm just going to say um, Eric Mazur has a book on concept tests. These are used uh, throughout the institute. It's used in Teal. They're used in Unified. It's a, it's a nice little book. It's about an hour and a half read. I urge you to take a look at it. It's really um, useful. But the concept tests are things like this. So normally we think about at MIT, here's a circuit, solve it. Write the equations and solve it. Um, this is a conceptual question. What happens when we close the switch? There aren't really equations to solve. You have to understand what's going on here. And if there's people who know a little bit about circuits, I'll just tell you that the naive view is that when you close the switch, you're providing more juice to this circuit. And therefore, this bulb ought to get brighter. And the expert view is, no, there's a zero potential here, and a 12 volt potential here, and a 24 volt potential here. And if these bulbs are the same and you have current flowing through, this potential will be split in half and there'll be a 12 volt potential here. And putting 12 volts across a 12 volt potential doesn't change anything. So the right answer is nothing happens. And so when you get a student to, to focus on a question like this, it sort of challenges their understanding. And if they get the naive answer that you know, the intensity of light bulb B increases, then there's an opportunity to talk to them about why that's wrong. And of course, there's data. This is data that um, Missouri took at Harvard. This is from a year where he didn't do peer instruction and a year where he did do peer instruction. The x-axis is the conventional score, solve the equations, use Kirchhoff's laws to solve the equations. And the vertical one is a question like the one I just showed. Do you conceptually understand what's going on with the circuit? And what he found is that there were plenty of students who, who could completely solve the circuits and had no idea what was going on. That's what this bubble is. And in fact, most of the class didn't understand what was going on, but they got a wide range of analytical scores. And then he introduced peer instruction, and now there's still a wide range of analytical scores, but most of the class understands conceptually what's going on, and that's an improvement. And I show this to students to say, 
This is why we're doing it. It works. And then I show them this one. Now, I didn't do something longitudinal, um, but I looked at my own data. And here was a, a question that I think I had a pretty good concept question on in class. And then when I um, quizzed the students on it, well, this is MIT, right? Everyone can solve the equations, right? Not like the previous data. Everything's above a 5 this way. Uh, but everything's above a 5 this way, which is great, which means at least on this particular concept, I connected with the students. This question, analytically, everything's above a 5, but there's a lot down here conceptually that's, you know, 0, 2, 3, 4. And what happened was I designed a poor concept question. And when I read the student responses, I, under, I thought back to what I had taught, and I understand what I did wrong, and I changed the concept question the next year. But there's a lesson here, which is that the educational outcome can depend critically on a single lecture or even a few minutes within a lecture. And on the one hand, we don't normally think that way. And on the other hand, we should think that way because why would you be lecturing if it weren't true? Right? But we don't treat our lectures that way often. So um, that was my experience in Unified. I want to talk briefly about this thing that I've started doing called stand-up recitations. So what happened was that in Unified, we had all sorts of active um, exercises in the lecture, but we were teaching the conventional recitation. Right? I go into the room. I give four or five example problems. Are there any questions? Students ask very pointed questions about how they solve number three on the homework. Not very effective. Right? So the basic idea here is to have students work simultaneously at the board in small groups to encourage interaction between the students uh, and with the faculty. And to me, what this really does is it emphasizes the idea that I'm coaching students, not telling students the answer. So um, here's what it looks like in practice. So you just divide the room up into boards. Um, so we have two students sort of working on this piece, and there's two students over here working on this piece. And here I am intervening with a couple students to help them out. And one of the things you can see, even though these aren't great pictures, is that from a distance, you can tell what's going on in the room. You can tell what students are doing, which you can't do when students are working at tables. So let me just talk about how I, how I do this. So before the class, I prepare a range of problems. So I might prepare four problems, anticipating that I'm only going to get through two or three. But I don't know what's going to happen in the class, right? So I have to be ready in case they do really well and I, I need to have four questions. Um, I divide the class into groups. The best size is two students per group. You always have an odd number, so you put three in. Uh, if board space is a real problem, I may put three in a group. Um, one thing you have to be careful of is group self-selection. You sometimes have the weaker students shunted together. And so I'll often say, well, work with someone you've never worked with before. Or I'll count out the students and make sure that, you know, that there are, are, are good groups. And then you assign board space to each group. And if there's not a bl enough blackboard space, you can use these big post-it posters. And that works just as well. And then you explain the problem carefully. You make sure that you, you ask you know, does everyone understand? Because you want everyone to work on the right problem. Um, and then the groups begin working the problem. And then what happens is that I and my TA circle the rooms and, and look at what students are doing. And we intervene as appropriate, right? And that's the tricky part. You don't want to do it too early, but you want to make sure that students don't waste a lot of time as well. Uh, and students may say, I don't understand. I need some help. And they'll call us over. And at the same time, I'll monitor sort of the entire room, which is easy to do because they're standing. And sometimes everything's going fine. I don't have to do anything. The students work the problems. Sometimes I realize no one knows what's going on. And it would be foolish to let them go on. So I intervene, and I maybe have a little mini lecture, and then I let them go again. right? And then some groups, you know, they'll be the stars in the group, and they'll do the problem in three minutes. And you want to make sure you have a backup so they don't get bored. So you say, well, think about this other problem um, to keep them going. 
And then after all the groups or most of the groups have finished, you need to wrap up. And if not all the groups have gotten the correct answer, that means explaining the correct answer. Sometimes it's like everyone did it right, let's move on. Sometimes you need to explain it. Uh, if there's a common theme among the mistakes, it's a really good opportunity to address the misconceptions that led to those problems. Uh, and then you may give a little mini lecture. So there may be hidden in the problem, you, you know, you may ask the problem to introduce an idea that they haven't thought about, and it may be a good time to just speak for 10 minutes about that. And then you do another problem. And one of the tricks is it's very dynamic, right? So you have to have a plan. If I have enough time, I'll do another problem. If there's seven minutes left, I can't do another problem. So maybe I should take questions or maybe I should lecture. So you have to have a little bit of a plan. And then uh, one of the things that we found uh, when we didn't do this, students want this, the solutions published. Because if they're working at the board, they can't take notes. So we always publish the solutions after the recitations. So this is my last slide. Uh, what are the benefits of it? Well, all the students are engaged. I mean, we all know that if you're in a recitation and students are sitting, they're looking at their phone, they're on Facebook, they're not engaged. Everyone has to be engaged. Um, two working at a board works better than two working at a desk. If Jeff and I are assigned to work on a problem, especially at MIT, we'll both pull out a piece of paper and start working independently, <laughs> right? Or we'll pull out one piece of paper and I'll hog it and Jeff won't be able to contribute, <laughs> right? But at a board, anyone can step up and write something on the board. Um, no one can hide, which is important because students love to hide. And no one can stand out. No one stands out, and that's also important because no one wants to stand out, right? Um, and it's much, much easier for me as an instructor to get involved with the students. So if Lori's working on a question over here and I want to see what she's doing, and I come over and I'm looking at, right? Sorry to do that to you, but, no. you, but, but you get very nervous and awkward and it doesn't work. Oh, I'm sorry, I yeah. didn't realize I was supposed to get nervous and awkward. I thought it was okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead. But you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. But, if, but if I walk up to two people talking, now it's just three people having a conversation, right? Um, it's easy to spot groups that need help. And for me, it's much more rewarding than conventional ex recitations. I don't like talking at people for 50 minutes. I like talking with them, right? And um, it may not work for all classes, but for the kinds of classes I've taught, I, I would never go back to a conventional recitation. This is, for me, the way to go for this kind of class. <laughs>